Um, you know, I, I, I again, thank you again for allowing me to speak. I, I started off um, uh, in, in the 90s during the super pave, or the, they called it at that time the sharp asphalt, uh, or the super pave, which turned into super pave, but back then it was a strategic highway research program. And that's where the super paved gyratory, super paved specifications were born. And my master's was actually on the super paved gyratory on, um, on working on the actual number of gyrations. Uh, from there, I worked at the state. I, I, I wrote specifications. I was over the bituminous section uh, for Kentucky. Uh, thus, the, that's not uh, the UK. That is University of Kentucky behind me. Uh, from uh, from there, I, I worked for a, a major oil company called Coke Industries, so where I was in product development for 12 years, and then I worked at Asphalt Institute as the senior research engineer and and, and helped with training um, during my tenure there. And then 2017, I started my own company, and uh, like I, and what I do is I bring innovation. I like to say innovation doesn't belong on shelves; it, it belongs on a roadway. So I get to bring innovation and, and bring a very unique experience as I help folks uh, understand and commercialize uh, products and, and get involved in all sorts of forensics and other projects. Great. So you're going to be talking to us today about uh, fiber reinforced pavements. I guess, uh, what's the connection between um, something like SuperPave and, um, and fiber reinforced pavements? Yeah, that's a really good question. SuperPave uh, did, uh, it, it did not have all of these things, but they knew um, that that there would be new products invented so what's what happened during the super pave time was aggregate specs were developed binder specifications were developed uh understanding the shear properties and we moved from pretty much recipe specifications more towards fundamental testing that we could begin to do uh the testing we're doing today called balanced mix design uh, it was it was conceived back then but but it took years to be able to simplify the test to be able to get it where we can move it forward today so while it's not a perfect system, these things such as aramid fibers and, and the bio oils and the plastics, um, while not a perfect measure, we're able to put those into the system, such as the gyratory, and it, it's still very valid uh, to be able to use those in, the, in those mechanisms today. Thank you, Future Roads uh, Conference, for allowing me to have the opportunity to present on aramid fiber. Today, we're gonna to be talking about uh, sort of the what, how, why, and fill performance of uh, fiber. This is a product that's been very uh, unique to me and one that I have learned to come to appreciate and glad to share this information with you. I also wanna thank uh, George at Enforce for, for getting me connected. And, and again, wanna say hello from the United States and especially from my home state of Kentucky. We're going to look at the challenges today, why we modify, and then we'll talk a little bit more about what is aramid fiber. We'll get into how it's introduced to the plant, the fiber in the field, and then look at a few case studies. So why do we need to modify our mixes today? I'm sure the same as in New Zealand is what we're having in the United States. While we have seen a, an, an increase on in our rural interstate system here of traffic, and after our 9-11 event in 2001, we've had a, a slight decrease in our traffic counts. However, if you notice, we continue to have our loads uh, calculated by easels in increase to over 750% uh, since 1970. So even though we as engineers begin to think we're over designing our roads, what we're coming to find out is that they are increasing at a rate that's even surpassing our assumptions on, on the load. In 2021, the American Society of Civil Engineers gathered information on our infrastructure, and this included things such as our water network, our, our pipes, uh, our internet, and so on. One of the things that they looked at is, is our, is our uh, infrastructure report card. On the report card, they specifically looked at highways. And when they went into the, the highway and began to put a grade on it, we ended up getting a D. Uh, this is the same we had received uh, just a few years earlier in, 20, um, in 2017. This D rating uh, means that 43% of our roads is now in poor to mediocre condition. So we've done a really good job at building our system <clears throat> since the 60s. However, we have not done a great job at maintaining it. This beca is because we continue to expand our roadways and, and tend to get behind on what we need to be doing to maintain them. Uh, we still have traffic fatalities, I'm sure most countries do. And, and any fatality is a, is a bad fatality. And at least 27 of our 50 states have depaved road or allowing them to go back uh, to an aggregate base. 
Today, we're moving towards a balanced mix design to try to improve what we're doing here in the U.S. Balanced mix design is simply using uh, using appropriately conditioned samples and, and looks at different mode of, of, of distresses as we're trying to understand these performance tests. One is a Hamburg wheel tracker you see here on the left. We also are using the asphalt pavement analyzer and then quicker tests such as what we call ideal RT or hot IDT, some, some, some quick tests that would simulate what we're doing here, more advanced test called flow number test. Uh, on the right is a quick test that we can use for understanding cracking, and we call this one the ideal CT. There's alternates to this also, uh, such as the SCBI fit, but this one seems to be the simplest and one that we can even run at the contractor's plant. The balanced mix design plan is, is sort of the concept that was put out years ago. And, and if you're looking on the and trying to understand, we, we want mixtures that are highly stable, but and also have high durability. Currently, uh, we tend to be in the left area over here, and we need to move our mixers to the right. But it's not done by asphalt content alone, just as this graph shows you. So we're always going to have this balance between rutting and cracking, it seems, if we were only looking at the, at the asphalt content. So how do we do this? How do we put modifiers in? How do we change our aggregate? And that's a, while that's a whole other uh, discussion, I'll show you just a few things that we're doing with aramid fiber. If I begin to graph this and I look at rutting resistance on the bottom and cracking resistance on the top or on the, on the left, on the y-axis, I, I get these quadrants that I look at for balanced mix design. And this is uh, somewhat the way that we're looking at it nationally, the way our mixtures are. The top left represents poor rutting and good cracking. That's where we used to be. And the bottom right, the where, or the, the bottom uh, right that we have here is poor cracking, but good rutting resistance. And that's where we are now. This is where we were in the early 90s, late 80s, and this is where we are now. We're trying to move our mixtures. What we want to do is end up in this quadrant here where we have strong rut resistant mixes that are also very crack resistant or highly durable. While I put this box in here, some arbitrary values, um, and uh, such as a rutting, uh, uh, rutting resistance um, uh, index that we have here, and then a uh, of, of 10,000 or better, and then a um, ideal CT number of 100 or better. Here you look at a PG6422 asphalt and a 7022 that would be modified. By using a different binder source, for instance, I can quickly move uh, to this upper right. Notice I have better rutting and I have better cracking simply by switching a crude source. Now, by taking this green one, which, which would be falling outside the box, and I put a product in it, uh, such as uh, aramid fiber that I'm holding up here, by doing that, uh, now I have moved this to a superior mixture, uh, one that would greatly exceed expectations in rutting and cracking. So what is aramid fiber? Uh, aramid fiber, quickly go over it, is, is a high, is a, is a high performance man-made polymer fiber. Um, more commonly known as by its brand name, by one company, Dow, for instance, sells what they call Kevlar. Uh, there are several different brands out there, but aramid fiber is, is a generic uh, term for that. It's one that has not been used much in our industry. Uh, in times past, we've seen things such as a cellulose fiber. Cellulose is a fiber that's used like a sponge in SMAs for absorption. Uh, we've used <clears throat> other types of fiber, uh, like a poly, uh, uh, like a polypropylene type fiber, I believe that's the, what this one is, or uh, no, this is a PET fiber, a PET. And, and this fiber is one that was used to reinforce uh, in, the, in the 90s. But the fiber that I'm showing here, the aramid fiber, can be cut to length, and, and this fiber, as it's manufactured, is incredibly heat resistant. Um, it's used in ballistic protection, uh, automotive industry, uh, ropes, cables, optical fiber, and, and so on. This fiber uh, that I'm talking about, if you begin looking at it, um, I showed you PET earlier, and this is just an idea of a stress and, and, and strain curve. As you, as you look at where the PET fiber may be, the PET is, is coming in here around number six, uh, noting that aramid is incredibly uh, high in its way up here, only to be topped out by, by products such as a carbon fiber, which, which is not what we're using today. Uh, we want to focus on these, these products that are in here. Aramid fiber um, is about eight, is about 10 microns and stronger than steel. We're using about 65.6 grams of aramid fiber and, and about 40 grams of wax and that's a sassavit wax, and we turn this fiber that's pulling off of a, of a spool into a product like this that looks like a somewhat of a, a Q-tip. 
And these fibers will then go into the plant and the wax coating will come off. And this, the wax coating is, is just an inert ingredient that allows us to carry it in there and it does nothing to the mixture. Uh, the wax quickly comes off and then the fiber will expand in the mixture, allowing us to provide, if you want to think about it, uh, as a rebar type of reinforcement in asphalt mixtures and giving it something that we have not had um, as considering that we need uh, more tensile reinforcement. As of, as of this year, there is an ASTM specification um, on this product, and it's D8395, that standardizes how we can specify aramid fiber in hot mix asphalt. When you take a closer look at the fiber, you'll see that what's called hair-like fibrils, as, as you take this fiber and you begin to roughen the edges of it, uh, that 10 micron fiber will then root into the mixture. Uh, it's very easy to see, and as you pull up the mixture, you can see the fiber actually uh, holding the mixture together. So it's not promoting adhesion to the aggregate as much as it is cohesion of the mixture. I'll give some more examples of that. This is just a quick comparison to polymer. I, I, I love polymer asphalt. I love what it does to, to, to binders. Uh, it allows them to be able to expand the grade and so on. Uh, however, we're able to do something very similar in a different way with aramid fiber. And, and this is just giving you the comparison of, of one versus the other. Fiber, you do not have to worry about compatibility, but I do wanna add this and, and not just to say one versus the other. When you use the two together, you get this incredible synergy that even makes somewhat of a super binder. But you can use it, let, let's say in lieu of, of, a, of a polymer binder if needed. Now, something I wanna mention are, are some words that's on here, such as ARCA, which would be like an asphalt reinforced uh, composite uh, or an aramid reinforced composite uh, mixture that we're looking at, or FRAC, which, which, which we're looking at uh, just a way to explain that this is a, a reinforced asphalt composite, a reinforced asphalt cement. This is standing for fiber reinforced asphalt cement. As far as academic findings, um, the company that I'm closest to is, is one called Surface Tech here in the U.S. and and Enforce there works um, uh, with with Surface Tech. Um, and as we began looking at the academic findings, Surface Tech has invested quite a bit of, of research in what they've been working on. During this time, uh, what they have done is is looked at things such as um, Oregon State has looked at at, at products such as, uh, or, or tests such as rutting and cracking. Cal Berkeley uh, has looked at things such as uh, fatigue testing and cracking. Missouri uh, began to look at things, as you can see here, such as, um, um, uh, such as um, uh, things such as rutting and cracking. And the list goes on and on. And looking at what New Hampshire has done, Al University of Alberta looking at it in cold regions, Texas A&M did work for Florida as they began watching uh, as they begin watching and trying to understand uh, how it will play out on the NCAT test track. More to come there. University of Cincinnati and NCAT, um, on and on, the National Center for Asphalt, Asphalt Technology. And then, the, and then the, the parent project looks at this in the cold region up in Minnesota that we call Minroad. Rowan University has looked at this, evaluating it for the Department of Defense in cold regions, such as Alaska. Asphalt Institute, where I used to work. Uh, Advanced Asphalt Technology, and of course my company now, Blankenship Asphalt Tech and Training, we have done an extensive amount of testing. So this product is very well proven in the research, but what good is research unless we can go and actually put it down and get it on the roadway? Um, research is not good on shelves, it's much better on the roadway. On a national side, you can see just states that we've listed here, New York, Kentucky, California, uh, Florida is in deep evaluation, and even putting it up in, in Canada. Locally, uh, where I'm at in Louisville and Lexington, the cities uh, here, um, and, and Louisville is where they run the Kentucky Derby, and Lexington is, 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 is the other city here right next to me. And this is areas where uh, the aramid fiber is being used uh, extensively in the cities as an alternative to help them with, with, with cracking. So you can see very quickly uh, the fiber makes a difference. At a plant level, just to go through these fairly quickly, um, the, the plant, uh, a company like Surface Tech would work with you to understand where it would be best to go in, and it really depends upon the plant. Batch tower, yes, it would, it would go in, in the pug mill area. In this case, it would be fed maybe through a wrap collar um, that you would, you would put in at this type of, of, of the drum plant. Of course, you get into counter flows and so on, and it really needs to, you talk to the manufacturer in the best place that the fiber can enter. Uh, so that, that, that allows the fiber with the wax to come off and again to expand. The fiber can be manually dosed on small projects with a, with a kit that you see here, or on larger projects, um, you can use an automated dosing machine that will weigh out the fiber and keep it flowing uh, so you, it will match the plant speed so you're able to get 
65.6 grams of fiber per ton, and that will then produce a report at the end of the day. Here's a picture of fiber addition as it's going on the wrap belt and, and, heading, and heading up to the, uh, I'm gonna head over to the wrap collar. When we get to the field, you begin to see, and this is just a material transfer device, but showing this where you can see the fibers coming off of it and the fiber on the front of a paver. And it, business as usual, unless you're looking for it, you really won't notice it. Uh, it works, compacts, and, and, and mixes very easily. It does not even change uh, the mix design, which makes it a really easy process uh, for addition in the laboratory and addition in the field. Another one that, that was done, I like to mention uh, a local airport that I've had an opportunity to work with and work with several airports lately. And that's been able to use the fiber for a more crack resistant surface. In this case, we used it as an interlayer at a local general aviation airport and trying to uh, help reduce cracking over a micro cracked uh, surface. This is an interlayer that you see on the left and notice you can't even see the fiber in the pavement uh, in the interlayer, but it is there. <clears throat> Keep in mind that now we're, we're actually getting into what we need as an EPDs, environmental product declarations. It seems like it's almost in every presentation, so I'm no different throwing it in this one. But this is the answer to like lead credits uh, in the, in the uh, horizontal paving world. And the reason this becomes important is we must have sustainable solutions. We can't handle these pavements the last eight and 10 years. We need to be coming up with 10 year, 25 year uh, pavement solutions for the surface while we understand that what we're doing underneath uh, should be perpetual. Surface Tech actually contracted with a, with a company called WAP to perform a cradle to grave analysis. You can see here it gave it a 20% increase in time to intervention results or repaving, which results in a 10% reduction in a 50 year cradle to grave impacts. On a local uh, wrap project I looked on, we looked at just a 30% uh, potential reduction that we believe is there on, on uh, CO2. Aramid Fiber is an incredibly lightweight product, which also makes it very friendly for shipping. A few case studies, and then we'll, we'll close out. Um, one is we began to look at this one in the city of Plainfield, Indiana. Now, this is close to the Indianapolis 500 race track, if one way you want to think about it, and, and close to the Indian, uh, and, and closer to the um, uh, uh, Indi, uh, Indianapolis airport. So this is a, this is a heavy truck route and they wanted to look and understand how the 7622 would compare to 7622 with fiber. Uh, this was in, uh, installed in 2018 and, and very quickly, just a few months afterwards, they began to see cracks forming in the control, but in the fiber section, there was no tracks, cracks. Well, that's great, but how does it do, um, how does it do as we continue on and, 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 and look at further sections? Well. We, as we moved on into time and now into 2022, you can continue to see the cracks coming in the control that the fiber section, fiber section continues to look good. 186 cracks compared to 21. That's nice, but, but let's continue on. When we began to look at it, and, and, and I went and take a look at this project, uh, we, we went and, and did a further analysis on it and actually did the crack length. And we actually went in there and looked at this one and found that we had, I'm gonna use Imperial units, about 400 feet of cracking um, as compared to uh, less than, uh, about less than 50 feet of cracking. Massive difference in cracking performance where the fiber section is greatly outperforming um, the, the control. Well. Keep in mind that these are both in equal length sections that, that we're looking at. And in this case here, one foot is equal to about 0.3 meters. So that'll give you a rough idea. But to scale, the, the simple way to put it is that this one has a, a lot less or a lot more cracking than what this one does. Easy to see. We also have got an opportunity to use it in a structural. Now, I mentioned to you earlier about the interlayer. I do want to mention that on an interlayer, we can take asphalt and begin to make it do stuff like this. And that's just by putting fiber in. When we go and we look at things such as, as, as high recycle, uh, we can do that too. But that in, when we do that, we're using a bio oil, but we use that in combination with aramid fiber. Um, by doing these combinations, it's allowing us um, as engineers to custom design these for performance versus just doing the same old uh, thing. This product uh, or this project is named after a famous uh, racehorse, Man of War, uh, as we named some of our streets here in, in Lexington. And in this one, uh, we're looking at a, a 200 millimeter um, uh, plus a 50 millimeter overlay. So uh, together, we're looking at a 250 millimeter structure in the intersection. 
And then uh, we're also comparing that to an area where we only did a 50 millimeter mill and fill. This was constructed in 2020, just outside the Lexington airport. And, and again, the main line that we have is also the same thickness of 250 millimeters, but they only milled off 50 millimeters to put something back on a surface. The focus was on the intersections that I'll show you here in just a moment. This was the construction that was done um, as, we, as we led into this one. Uh, this is the fiber machine that was used. And, and as we began cooling the mat down uh, after compaction, and of course, uh, my team was out there doing density testing. This is what the project looks like today. Um, in, a, in a beautiful area of Kentucky. And just to the left, and if you can see this, this is the Bluegrass Airport. So what we did was we decided to go out and do falling weight deflectometer testing. And this became very important for us to do because we needed to understand, did we satisfy the need of what the city of Lexington has asked us to do? They wanted a better structure in place and something that would compete with concrete pavement, but do it with a, with a thinner lift. And so could we do that and could we come up with a, with a structure that was able to do that? So by using a falling weight deflectometer uh, that you saw there, we, we did that just that. The orange sections represent the main line uh, where you have the old pavement with just, a, with just a, 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 an overlay that was put on it. The red, the green, and the purple sections, the red, green, and purple are the intersections where the full depth 250 millimeter fiber reinforcement went in. As you can see, and, and again, sorry I haven't got these converted, but one PSI is equal to about 6.89 kilopascals. The orange sections, which is the main line, comes in at 400,000 PSI. That is very common. Uh, what I've always been told that the modulus of a pavement would be is 400,000 PSI, uh, even with uh, the upgraded surface that was put on it. When I compare that to the full depth, and I'm not looking at the, the underlayment, I'm not looking at, um, uh, we did measure it, but I'm not looking at the, the, the aggregate that's in place and, and, and other things, just looking at the asphalt pavement itself. We upgraded this to nearly an average of about 750,000 uh, or over, um, way over a 50% increase, 75% increase in, in just modulus. Now, how does that transfer to structural number? Well, that transfers to about a 20% improvement in structural number that we were able to make. So did we complete what we needed for the city of Lexington? Absolutely. We're continuing to monitor this. The project that I mentioned earlier in Plainfield, Indiana, is, is currently showing on a PCI, pavement condition index rating, about a six point improvement, six to eight point improvement. And this one is, is all about the same because this is a, a newer project. But we are monitoring these with um, with, with uh, video capability and, and actually converting that over to a pavement condition rating as we continue to look at all of the, uh, the pavement distresses. In summary, uh, what I'd like to leave you with today, and I appreciate your time and look forward to answering your questions here in just a moment. Um, this, this technology with using fiber uh, seems incredibly intuitive, one that I enjoy getting to present. It's proven uh, academically and in the field, very easy to use well-defined research, no change in your job mix formula, a sustainable solution by really focusing on extending the pavement life or reduction of construction cycles. And we're extending the pavement life by improving the cracking, the rutting, uh, the structural modulus, and of course the, the fatigue point that I was talking about earlier and things such as the interlayer. With that, I want to thank you for your time today. And at this point, I'd like to take any questions. If you wanna, I uh, always love connecting with folks. So if you would, please connect with me on LinkedIn or, or, or Twitter. And uh, this is my QR code here where you can um, uh, get my information. And again, I look forward um, um, to answering your questions and future roads. Thank you very much for allowing me to present at your conference today. Excellent. Well, thanks very much for that presentation, Phil. I think um, you know the audience appreciate it. We've got lots of questions coming in, so that's great. Uh, Going to spend a couple of minutes uh, because we've got a couple of minutes left in the session, uh, asking some verbal questions. I'll kick it off with some that are in um, in the system, and then we might have a roving mic around if people want to ask you some direct ones as well. But um, first up, a uh, question: Do fibre reinforced uh, concrete surfaces exhibit a rougher texture compared to traditional? asphalt concrete. Additionally, what textures and me measures can be employed to ensure a uniform and well-mixed uh, fiber reinforced? Yeah, well, the <clears throat> I'm surprised nobody has asked me if my lab is into uh, bourbon testing yet. We have not expanded into that uh, just yet. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the, the fiber, uh, you would not know it, it is in the mixture 
unless you begin to look for it. And and so concerning uh, working with it, uh, the guys that's running, we call them a loot, but it's the large rake uh, that, that they're moving when you pull it up. You can see the fibers on it. <clears throat> those, those folks will know that it's there. Hmm. Doesn't make it harder to work with. Uh, if anything, it probably helps with holding the mat together, making it easier to compact, but there's no documentation on, other than the roller guys telling you it's, <clears throat> they think they get better density. Um, Concerning, you know, the, the texture on the surface again. No, it does not affect ride. Again, you, you don't. Again, you can't. You can't see it uh, once it's compacted. What was the, the the other part of that? Was how do you ensure the the distribution? So, the couple of different ways. Uh, what I like to do. First off, I need to know the quantities in there. So the, through the automated dosing machine, I get a readout. Uh, that's good, and, and if I have a trusted supplier, and that works really well. I actually just did the QA on an airport, and I asked for that very report. <clears throat> at the end of the day, I want to make sure it gets in there. But just because it went in, did it all go in at one time or did it get spread out like it should be? So there's a visual test that I, that I as an inspector can look at. The other thing is I pull a sample. I can pull the sample and what I do is, is I take the sample and I quarter the sample and I pull each side and I should have the same amount in each quarter of 0 .005665, well, whatever that is, 656%. Six, um, or 65 grams per, 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 um, per metric ton. And, and if I have that distribution that I see in there, uh, that's, that's how I can best tell that it's been put in the mixture. Uh, one is, um, have you had many challenges convincing road controlling authorities to adopt fiber mixes? <clears throat> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> um, <clears throat> yes, um, the low the low bid system um, is great, but it all and I don't have another answer. It's it's also the the demise of of implementing new technologies. It's the low bid system by nature is is risk adverse. So because of that, it, it takes a while. This technology has been around. Um, Fibers were down in the 90s and we knew they worked and the advanced fibers came out over 20 years ago and you're just now seeing them um, uh, really pushed into industry. Still with that, you're, you're probably looking at still a very small percentage of the marketplace. And I look at it from my perspective, I'm going, you know, why wouldn't I put this in? It's like rebar and concrete. However, uh, when you have a risk adverse environment, it is. It's, a, it's an uphill battle. That's why we're seeing uh, some of the private entities, truck stops, um, cities uh, quickly adopting it, and then and then once you once you begin to trickle that in, and folks see what it does, they they start to adopt. But uh, no different than today, polymer was introduced in 1980s, and there's some states that in some in some places in the world that still go, should we be using polymer asphalt? Right. Uh, one more question. I think we've got time for. Uh, we've got about two minutes left in the session. Uh, so, Phil, um, how does the co it's cost versus value question? So, how does the upfront cost and whole of life value compare to, say, a standard pavement? Sure. Um, you know, um, it, from what I've seen, it, it does not cost ten percent more to the contractor. But by the time they the manufacturer puts it in, what I'm seeing on the on the bidding side. Um, is, is by the time it gets through, it's about a 10% increase cost on the mixed ton. Uh, that's, an, that's an about, okay, a rough number. But on a project, um, if you have a significant project going down, it's going to be less than 1% of project cost. Uh, when you look at the mobilization and everything that you have to do to get it in, uh, it's, it's very easy to implement. Concerning, you know, life cycle cost, when you, when you look at a pavement, let's say that lasts 10 years and you're moving it to a 13, 14 year life, 15 year life, all you have to do at 10% increase in cost is 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 just doing a, with a with a discount rate I think of 5% or so. You're looking at again just uh, equalized annual or annualized dollars, uh, like a life cycle cost analysis. All you have to do is make that payment last about one year longer. Um, as a matter of fact, it's like 0.9 years longer, and and it is money in your pocket after that. Great. All right. Well. Um Got to give you a big thanks uh, on behalf of Future Roads Conference for joining us today, Phil. I think um, you know. Thanks for answering all the questions. Thanks for presenting. Uh, I wish I had. Uh, I wish a virtual bottle of wine was as good as the real thing. But I hope the Future Roads team are, are looking after you uh, well. And yep, you got the water. That's the way. Um, I hope. Uh, no, great. Good on you. Thanks. Thanks very much for joining us. And I uh, wish you all the best. Um, and as Phil said at the start, if anyone wants to look him up on LinkedIn or anything like that, he's very welcome to. You're very welcome to, and he can answer any further questions uh, on behalf of the conference. Thanks very much for joining us, Phil, and you have a good rest of the day. Thank you all. Have a, have a great rest of the day.